Hello and welcome everyone. I hope you're all well. My name is James Kelly. I work at Pluto Press and I'm very excited to be joined by David Austin, Alyssa Trotz and Asad Haider who are here to discuss the Black and Caribbean radical tradition, political strategy and how we organize for change in these turbulent times. Just wanna start with a big thank you to Between the Lines for putting together tonight's event. Some of you joining us might not know, but this event is part of an online series of events called Radical December, a varied multilingual program of round tables, talks and debates around the ideas that will transform the world to come. Radical December is a collaboration between Literal, a radical festival of books and ideas in Barcelona, and the Radical Publishers Alliance, which is formed of radical publishers from across the globe, challenging our broken social and economic systems. You can find the full schedule of events over at literalbcn.com and make sure you're using the hashtag Radical December. Um, and feel free to use the chat function here to ask questions for our, our brilliant panelists. Uh, now I'd like to, to introduce our incredible speakers here to discuss the transformative thinkers and ideas behind the Black radical tradition. I'm really delighted to be joined by David Austin. David is the author of numerous books, including Dread Poetry and Freedom, Linton Questy Johnson and the Unfinished Revolution, and Fear of a Black Nation, Race, Sex and Security in 60s Montreal, an editor of Moving Against the System, the 1968 Congress of Black Writers, and the making of global consciousness, which you can get from Pluto Press or Between the Lines. Next, we have Alyssa Trotz. Alyssa is the editor of The Point is to Change the World, Selected Writings by Andai, which is part of Pluto Press's Black Critique series. And for the last 12 years, she has edited an open weekly newspaper column in the diaspora and the Guyanese daily Stavrook News. And finally, we have Asad Haider. Asad is the author of Mistaken Identity, Race and Class in the Age of Trump, which is available from Verso Books. Assad is also a founding editor of Viewpoint Magazine. And Assad, I'll let, it let you take it from here. All right, uh, thanks everyone for attending. Um, uh, it's my pleasure to kind of moderate this discussion uh, between Elisa and David, who have uh, both um, published some really remarkable books uh, in collections. Um, uh, I, I, before I get to uh, the specific books, I wanted to pose a general question uh, to both of you, uh, which is, uh, you know, you've spoken about, uh, uh, you, you've kind of specified the idea of a Caribbean radical tradition, you know, in addition to Black radical tradition. And I am I'm interested in hearing from you about What's specific about that? How do you understand that tradition? Uh, and why it's important for us today? And, uh, and as we were discussing uh, some of the themes that we'd be talking about earlier, uh, Alyssa proposed a very uh, vivid uh, phrase, which was about thinking together the transnational articulations and Caribbean ripples that reverberate across space and time. So uh, I'm, I'd just like to hear some uh, uh, introductory thoughts about that to frame the discussion. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, I think there's a, so it's, it's a way of, the, the Caribbean radical tradition, I think, is a way of thinking about how one section of humanity has organized, going back really to the days of slavery, is organized in ways of, in order to radically transform the world, but through the experience of the people of the Caribbean. It's uh, a way of thinking about how people have organized from below. Sure, it embodies many aspects, of course, of the Black radical tradition too, but it's also a way of thinking about how in the kind of post-colonial period, if we can call it that, you know, thinking about the dynamics of statehood alongside race, class, and gender. So whereas we often talk about the Black radical tradition, and, and those conversations often veer towards the United States uh, and with good reason. I think the, the, the Caribbean radical tradition allows us to kind of think in more specific terms about a body of experience that comes from that particular part of the world. Mm -hmm. um, okay, thank you. I, thank you, Asad, for that question. And I wanted to thank everyone for joining us and to say what a, a pleasure it is to be here um, with David on this panel. You know, I, I, I think what David touches on there is really important going back to the point with which you opened us at about these sorts of uh, 
transnational reverberations and diasporic articulation so that when we think about the Caribbean, we're not, we, we have to think, where is the Caribbean? The Caribbean is in Montreal, it is in New York, it is in Chicago, it is in London. And so I think that the Caribbean radical tradition also offers us a way of making connections um, transnationally or internationally in relation to um, you know, the, the, the project of, of, of freedom and liberation. But you know, I'm here in a sense to, um, to share with you some of the work of this incredible social activist from Guyana, Andai, uh, who the Guyanese elder Yusi Koyana refers to as Guyana's conscience. And you know, a lot of folks won't know about her and I don't want to spend the hour sort of telling people everything about her, but the very fact that you won't know about her or that I might need to situate her, I think is instructive and tells us something about the boundary setting work that tradition does. And so at the very, same time that we invoke something like a Caribbean radical tradition, I think we need to also open ourselves up to the possibility of contingency and boundaries. There was a small acts discussion on um, uh, a round table that I think was, was uh, chaired by Nigel Cunningham called a queer pair in which they talked about keeping the very argument about, they were talking about a black radical tradition. It had folks like Faith Smith and Bobby Hill and Anthony Vogues. Um, they talked about keeping the very argument I'm quoting here about a black radical tradition in perpetual motion. And I, I think that's what's really important here. And so if I'm thinking about the Caribbean radical tradition with the instance of someone like Andai as an exemplar of that, I have to admit to a certain kind of tension. For those who know who Andai is, you would understand why she would never refer to herself as a transformative um, figure. Um, you know, she she would um, and 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 so on the one hand, there's this desire to bring her, for instance, into a conversation about you know that that gestures the genealogy of. Caribbean people thinking and practicing and speaking and writing about justice and freedom as a kind of aspirational horizon. And at the same time, or simultaneously, thinking about the ways in which Andaye would absolutely disavow a certain way of thinking with and about tradition that is static, a way of thinking about tradition that makes lists because we have these lists and it's usually the lists of the great men, but the lesson that she has left us as an anti-racist and anti-imperialist uh, feminists from the Caribbean is that you, you don't replace the great men tradition with the great women tradition either. Um, and, and also that, you know, that is linked to uh, a, an uncritical and um, an unchanging sort of clear-eyed denunciation of big man, big woman, big person politics. She completely hated any kind of hagiographic account and would utterly distance herself um, from that, you know, there is a foreword in her book by Clem Citran, which she describes in the book as being a foreword of extraordinary generosity. But in fact, in emails written to us like a week before she went into hospital, um, when she was hugely in pain, she wrote to say she couldn't sleep. And it wasn't that she couldn't sleep because of the pain. She was like, I couldn't sleep because I'm so ashamed. I'm so ashamed by what Clem wrote. I mean, he wrote it about me as if I'm this amazing, you know, person that you put on a pedestal and I'm completely embarrassed. So so she was completely sort of opposed to that. And so if I could just say for me that, you know, so thinking about what someone like Andaya brings to Caribbean radical tradition in relation to thinking about contingency and dynamism, I would say for her, it is about challenging capitalism by organizing against all the work that capitalism makes us do. And that her entry point into that is by recognizing the labor of grassroots women, the labor of social reproduction beginning from the grassroots as the foundation and as the reproducer, the, the producer and reproducer of labor power. So that's number one. I think the, the second one would, would be um, uh, emphasizing the self-organizing and collective capacity and abilities and leadership of working people. So critiquing the top down and warped notions of leadership. And then I think the third, which I can elaborate um, later would be for us to think, you know, David talks about that movement across the Black and the Caribbean radical traditions, but thinking in particular about what Black means within the multiracial context of Guyana and the Caribbean. And if we connect that to Walter Rodney and particularly one essay in Black Power in the context of the West Indies and Groundings with my brothers, 
how blackness is understood within the multiracial context of the Caribbean and specifically in countries like Guyana and Trinidad, but others as well, Martinique, Guadeloupe, Suriname, um, the way in which articulating a politics of African and Indian solidarity in particular becomes central to developing that, which I, I think that's also very distinct to the radical tradition. And we find resonances with the way in which black gets um, defined in the British context in the 70s. And I think it is no accident that it happens there and must have a lot to do with the diasporic contributions of Caribbean people who moved to make London in particular their home. Very rich uh, answers. And uh, I, 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 we should return to Andai um, because um, you know, I'm very grateful to Alyssa for introducing me to this figure who uh, hopefully will become more widely read uh, thanks to this collection. Um, and b b before uh, elaborating on her, I mean, maybe in this spirit of, uh, uh, you know, um, decentering the, the uh, individual, we can talk about the uh, collaborations, connections. Uh, and I think David, uh, ha, you know, uh, he's written a book about Linton Kwesi Johnson who's another figure of Caribbean, Caribbean radicalism uh, moving, between, uh, moving between sites uh, in the UK as well and blurring boundaries in his work, poet, musician, intellectual, activist, and so on. And so, uh, can, David, I wonder if you can, in, in the way that Alyssa has kind of uh, situated Andai, uh, talk about uh, what is uh, important about Linton Kwesi Johnson, why you chose to write about him. Uh, sure. Well, I think the first thing I would say is that, you know, Linton Kwesi Johnson is a poet and a political figure, and he, and he conjoins those two in, a, in, a, in his poetic work. And, you know, when I wrote the book, part of many ways, the book is about Linton Kwesi Johnson, and it's not a way of trying to about how do we think about and, in, and engage in political conversation and ultimately political organization in more uh, actively creative ways. And, you know, poets have that kind of capacity to provide both insight and, and foresight, or what we often interpret as foresight. And it's not just poets, but obviously artists in general. Um, but it's actually insight in terms of their capacity to hone in to what is active and politically unfolding in front of our very eyes, but which in some respects, so-called quote unquote, ordinary people, we often, we often don't see. So Linton Kwesi Johnson in many ways kind of embodies that. And if we look at how his poetry has anticipated events in the 1970s, for, you know, 1980s, for example, like the, 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 the protests, the, we call in a sense kind of black power protests that um, uh, unfolded in the early 1980s across the UK. Um, that's just one example of how, you know, his poetic insight coming across a sort of foresight gave us some insight into, into those developments in many ways, which we can sort of think about as antecedents of um, the Black Lives, Black Lives Matter movement. Um, so for me, you know, when we think about politics, part of the point of that book is that in the same way that artists engage in creativity, we need to think about how we can... Uh, apply for lack of a better word, that same degree of creativity in thinking about politics. Linton Crazy Johnson is very much part of that, the, the Caribbean radical tradition that we're talking about, um, this conception that, uh, that, that Alisa talked about in terms of self-organization, the capacity of ordinary, ordinary people to, to organize, um, this, what he refers to as the each and every one, this idea that if we talk about politics, if we talk about socialism, it's about, uh, each and every one of us, as opposed to grand and political leaders, great men or great women for that matter, right? That politics is about ordinary people. Politics is about self-organization. Politics is about our creative capacity beyond, side con beyond uh, conventional politics to organize, to radically transform the world. Now, for Linton Crazy Johnson, that has meant uh, some form of uh, socialism, um, and some of his poems, influenced by Franz Fanon, Cesaire, and C.L.R. James, speak to those questions. Um, and we can, you know, we can talk some more about, you know, what what socialism or social change change might mean. But as a poet and as an artist, this is 
has been this has been his profound uh, uh, contribution to uh, our understanding of what poetry and poets and artists can do. And as a matter of fact, it kind of relates to, um, you know, in this wonderful book by Ndaye, where she talks about George Lamming, which uh, led Alyssa and I into a conversation. It very much speaks to 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 Ndaye's analysis of, of George Lamming um, in terms of him being an artist who has always had this kind of been able to kind of pinpoint on the important or some of the important political questions of our time and doing that through literature because obviously artists are not bound by methodologies and the same kind of strictures and the same kind of limitation that sometimes social scientists are. So they're free to imagine, to project and anticipate and, 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 and inspire. So, um, you know, in writing about this artist, it was really a way of trying to kind of think about how we can go beyond conventional ways of thinking about politics and drawing on some of the creativity in politics that artists express in, in their art. Well, I think this gives us a, a wonderful bridge back to Andai in the sense of the creativity of self-organization. And uh, one uh, aspect of, of uh, Andai's texts that really resonated with me was this emphasis on going back to very material questions of organization because often the, these topics uh, that are um, uh, explored in the, in, the, in the texts are discussed in a somewhat abstract way for you know, identity politics, race, gender, class. There, there can be very abstract discussions of these questions. But Andai really shows that there are uh, very uh, concrete organizational questions that are very uh, crucial to those discussions. And so, I, you know, I, I, we don't have time for me to uh, read uh, entire passages, which I, I set aside because they were really striking, but just a, a couple sentences from uh, some talks she gave. She, you know, she posed this question, how should we organize if we mean to unify the struggles of all sectors against capital, ensuring that we begin with those with the least power and resources in the capitalist hierarchy so that all are included. And she gives us an example, the unwaged worker, uh, referring to the question of social reproduction that uh, Alyssa brought up. And then she addresses the question of identity politics directly and says, you know, uh, sometimes uh, the criticisms of identity politics are used to question self-organizing by sectors who were not collectively visible before or whose issues were not granted priority by traditional organizations. And, and so she makes a distinction between a sector-based organizing, which uh, is, is focused on its own sector, and a kind of different uh, organizing in which there is autonomy, but there is also uh, the way uh, in which every sector is uh, fighting for the interests of all of them. And so, uh, Lisa, I, uh, I was hoping you could uh, help us understand uh, what what she means by this, and a, a little bit more about uh, her thinking on these questions of self organization and uh, sectors. Mm -hmm. Sure, but but first, let me go back to something that David um, said about Linton Quasi Johnson and art, because this was very important to Andaya too. George Lamming was someone very close to her and this whole notion that he has of the sovereignty of the imagination was something that really inspired her. And, you know, she was preoccupied not just with content, but with form. And, you know, if we had more time, we could go into some more discussion of, of form as it sort of manifests itself across this book of essays. She was completely opposed to the idea that I kept calling it chapters. It was completely exasperating to her and for her reveal the difference between me as an academic and her as someone who, as she said, moved from page to picket or from home to street. Um, um, but, but that form was really important and form and, and languaging the world and bringing a fresh new beauty into existence and thinking aesthetically about, about transformation was was also really important. And that's where I, I, I want to begin by saying the connection with Linton Quasi Johnson is, is, is really interesting. Her first degree was actually in French and Spanish and she had actually enrolled in a master's program at the University of Diana and was, was um, writing, I believe, a thesis on, that was going to look at madness in the novels of Edwidge Danticat and Jamaica Kincaid. And she had some 
short pieces in the anthology that kind of um, speak to that. And it wasn't, I, 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 I'll explain why before, before I answer your question as that, it wasn't just her, there were others involved in the anti-dictatorial movement and the Working People's Alliance as well, who were artists, Osase, who died this year, an amazing artist, Benuta Radzik, Brian Rodway, um, uh, Abyssinian, her own brother, whose sculpture sort of graces the inside cover of this book. And, and she's, she, she explains it this way in an interview that she does with David Scott in Small Acts, talking about the influence of the Guyanese poet Martin Carter. And I'm thinking particularly of a speech he gave in 1974, where he called for the creation of a free community of valid persons. And this is what she said. Even though we didn't have a lot of time to talk, there was always something in the politics of the Working People's Alliance that had to do with something other than the mechanistic story of where you put the blocks of the economy and the blocks of politics. Something other than the mechanistic story of where you put the blocks of the economy and the blocks of politics. And it started essentially with the kinds of persons we wanted to be in the world, the kinds of persons we wanted to be in the world. So what did it actually mean to have what Robin Kelly describes of Andai as a 360 vision? What did it mean to really think and listen and attend to the social motion on the ground. And I think the best way that I can answer your question about identity politics, as said, is with a concrete example. Let me say, however, that her take on this is far more nuanced than a simple knee-jerk dismissal of identity politics. It is, after all, the absence of women, or not just the, not the absence of women, but the way in which, for instance, in the aftermath of the collapse of the Grenadian Revolution, the women's arm of the People's Revolutionary Government sort of disintegrates. And her reflections on her position as a left woman within the WPA that led her to leave the WPA eventually and co-found the women's organization, the grassroots women's organization, organization Red Thread. It is her work with the women's movement and her increasing conscription, conscription into international consultancies in an era of neoliberalization that leads her to detect the class politics at the heart of women's organizing or the class politics that is a potential at the vulnerable heart of, of, of women's organizing um, that, that you know, is a direct thread with the essay in, in the, the anthology on the betrayal of Mr. Slime and what it means to smell the middle class, to be able to smell the middle class. She has another essay that's unpublished on um, when is the intellectual worker a traitor to the movement, which is that if you divide off. So the first thing is that, you know, the work of transformation must always keep at the forefront that it has to be anti-capitalist and anti-imperialist. That is non-negotiable. We have to think about the struggles of all sectors against capital. This is her quote. Ensuring we begin with those with the least power and resources in the capitalist hierarchy. And given her interest in working with grassroots women and, and beginning with on wage caring labor, it's the on wage worker that you begin with. So the struggle of all sectors against capital is the starting point. But how do we then understand the struggle of all sectors? And the example I'll give um, very quickly here is um, what to me is the most remarkable essay in this collection, which is on the 1983 Housewives Rebellion at the height of what some people call the civil rebellion in the early 1980s. A lot of folks mistakenly assumed that the anti-dictatorial struggle ended when Walter Rodney was assassinated on June 13, 1980. And in fact, there was, a, a, an, a, there was this sort of upsurge that happened in 82, 83, that brought the best traditions of what Walter Rodney had, had engaged in Guyana and offered Guyana and learned from Guyana when the government at, at the time um, put a ban on many um, food items. And the housewives came out onto the street and bauxite workers who were predominantly African Guyanese in the context of long histories of racial division came out. Sugar workers, largely Indo-Guyanese came out. Taxi drivers came out. The government cracked down. And it's a remarkable essay where Andai is reflecting on this decades later. It's a remarkable exercise in reflexivity and the ability to change and to point out that your word is never the last word. Because she is saying that at the moment when it happened, the Working People's Alliance recognized how central housewives were. They were writing about it in their magazines. That's where she gets the sources, uh, along with her memory and speaking with brothers and sisters about what had happened to write this essay in the book. But what she says is even though they saw the housewives, 
they didn't have a clue what the significance of the housewives as a sector of the working class represented. And it's a remarkably frank and honest discussion where she gives examples of the mistakes they made. That one, they went out to organize with the sugar workers and the bauxite workers to bring them together across race. The Sugar and Bauxite Workers Unity Committee was established, but they didn't organize the housewives as housewives. They didn't go to meet the housewives where they were. That in some of the day clean literature, they made the mistake of distinguishing between the housewives and the rail workers. And then during this upsurge, they called the women's arm of the women's section of the WPA, it was never really a women's arm, held a meeting that included indigenous women, which was great, but she says one step forward, two steps backwards. We then also call for a mass organization of women, which would what, be attached to political party. So the housewives were completely erased, even though they clean has them all over there. And it's just remarkable because it is her reflecting on something she did not see at the time that leads her to say that, that, that housewives were actually the most central sector of the working class during that rebellion. They were traveling to Suriname illegally to bring back contraband items to keep food on the tables. They were refusing, they were going on strike when, um, when their men were um, falling down from hunger in Linden, which is what prompted one of the walkouts. So that the women were actually revolutionary, but that was not seen. And so that's where for her, unifying the struggles of all sectors against capital requires us to recognize that when you are in a movement, if you do not address the way in which difference manifests itself hierarchically, the movement will always represent those who have the most power. And therefore that within the movement, if you are to be faithful to representing all of the groups, she, she was influenced very strongly by Anna Ford Smith who had written a piece on the Jamaican um, theater organization, Sistrin, called Ringding in a Tight Corner, which examined precisely some of the race and class tensions within Sistrin, um, that, that if, unless you make space for that, the, the most powerful, which is usually the middle class, will be the ones who will reap the benefits on the backs of everyone else. And so when the sector sort of emerges to represent itself, be it in relation to race, sexuality, disability, it is simply the sector articulating the way in which its specific needs are being silenced or sidelined. But when it becomes negative is when that sector does not rejoin or participate in the larger discussion of the fight against capital and becomes preoccupied only with the sector in and of, in and, of and for itself. That's a really long answer, but I, I hope that really, that makes sense. No, I think it's just to, to add. I think it's a it's a beautiful answer, and it, it kind of as you were talking, as I said, made me think about. You know, there's this article by by uh, Bobby Hill by Robert Hill about George Beckford, where he talks about the transition that George Beckford, the Jamaican economist, made from um, his involvement in New World to a bank, and he talks about how George Beckford came to the conclusion that the emphasis needed to be on the black dispossessed. Now we can talk about how that notion excluded a range of groups within that conception of who the black dispossessed were. But what, what was interesting and in, in, in the way you talk about how Andai came to that conclusion is tied to what Bobby Hill refers to how, you know, we talk about theory and we talk about practice, but then how that's materialized or realized through organization through organizing and through organization. So it's just interesting to see the way in which she came to those conclusions, not just by theorizing in, a, in kind of an abstract, but it came up directly as a result of her organizational practice within an organization. Mm -hmm. I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, mm -hmm. and actually going back to Assad's first point about these transnational articulations, right? I mean, she, she talks about how deeply she was influenced and struck by what happened to the women's arm of the PRG after 1983. But in relation to the question of autonomy, the, 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 the person and the group and the movement, this also comes out of her involvement with the um, with um, uh, wages for, for, for household work. Okay. Um, and it comes out of her long relationship with Selma James. She actually, in, in the early 1970s, and I uh, leaves Guyana for a bit. She comes back in 1978 to join the anti-dictatorial struggle, but she leaves Guyana and she's working in New York and she meets two women who would become part of Black Women for Wages for Housework, Wilmette Brown and uh, Margaret Tescott. 
She then meets Selma James in 1982 because she goes up to London as the WPA International Secretary and she gets involved in a strike that the English Collective of Prostitutes is having where they occupy, I think, a church. So she meets Selma, but she points out quite clearly that she didn't really, it didn't really sink in until the 1990s. So their principle of the sector and the autonomy and the need for all sectors to struggle against capital, but beginning with those who are on wage and also recognizing the importance of autonomous organizing, which is not smooth, right? It is not frictionless. It is not to be romanticized. It's best captured by this, the phrase um, that the WPA uses, which is unity in struggle, that it comes through this careful practice, this, you know, um, but but that but it, that it is from Selma James that that she is that she she gets that her long association with Selma and her participation for a time in um, both the International Women Count Network and in the Global Strike and in fact in the text she also talks about the, um, her sense of the influence of Selma on Walter Rodney who was part of the study circle um, with C L R James in London. And the evidence she uses are two things, which is one, the WPA party manifesto of 78, 79, where the housewives are recognized as a part of the working class. Now there's a difference between the recognition and then what actually happens. And she, she points to the failure to see what happened in 1982. Um, so, but, but she credits that as, um, you know, after discussions with the WPA folks at the time, her sense is that that line would have been inserted by Walter and that Walter would have gotten that from what he would have learned with Selma. And then the second one is um, an interview that a lot of people don't look at or talk about, an interview that Andrew Salki does with Walter Rodney in Andrew Salki's book. And uh, in that interview, Rodney is talking very clearly about autonomy and the need for autonomous sectors to organize. But gender is not part of his equation at all in there. He is talking about it in the context of African and Indian Guyanese and the need to organize autonomously, but the principle is, is, is very much at work there. And there again, and I think that that would have come from um, the way in which Selma was increasingly beginning to talk about how you organize while recognizing that there are different levels and scales of power within a movement. Mm -hmm. well, this um, uh, is a, it brings us to, um, to some of uh, David's other works. Um, there's uh, the, the connection through Walter Rodney. Uh, and th this is an interesting uh, topic to discuss because uh, David uh, put together a collection, the Moving Against the System, uh, which is the speeches and writings surrounding uh, the Congress of Black Writers at McGill University in Montreal in, in uh, October, 1968. Uh, Walter Rodney was present, CLR James was present, and uh, so, uh, and, and, and uh, you've also edited uh, a collection of James's lectures uh, in Montreal, and so uh, I, I wonder if you can uh, tell us a bit about these collections that you've done and how they relate to uh, what we've been discussing. Sure, I mean, <laughs> I think, you know, both the Congress of Black Writers and James's presence in Montreal, you know, speak to the kind of transnational uh, political, um, not events, but implications that, we, that, that, we've been, that we've been talking about and the way in which for a moment, Montreal became an important transnational, transnational political site. But I wanted to say something at the beginning and I kind of forgot about it. And, and it relates to the Congress of Black Writers. And that is that, you know, we can speak about tradition in various ways and, and, the, and the very notion of a tradition can be problematic as, um, as, as Alyssa pointed out. But you know, there was a person named Louise Langdon Norton who came from the dig in Grenada and moved to Montreal in 1917. And in many ways we can see her as a kind of precursor to what we call this black and Caribbean radical tradition in the North American context. Um, she became an active member of, of the Garvey's Universal Negro Improvement Association, in fact, the founding member, along with her uncle, also from Grenada, and went on to marry Earl Little in Montreal, and they went on to become actively involved in the UNA in the United States. And, you know, that woman, Louise Langland Norton, was Malcolm X's mother, and 
there hasn't been enough attention paid to her. I just finished reading a few days ago a beautiful article by the writer and poet Merle Collins from Grenada about Louise Langland. So I think there's a great deal more attention to be to to be to be paid to Louise Langland Norton, because when you think about the Congress of Black Writers, which was dedicated to both Martin Luther King and and Malcolm X, one of the things that is striking, of course, is that it was you know situated within the Black radical tradition, and you know there was all this kind of talk about radically transforming the world and black radical politics and, and, and black power. But it, it's also in many ways notable for its, for its absences, including the fact that when it could be dedicated to Martin Luther King and especially Malcolm X, um, there, there were no women who played an active public role in the event. There were uh, uh, very important women present, and particularly I think of Joan Jones, who um, is a, a black Canadian organizer and, and thinker who, who played a very prominent role in the 1960s that is often understated. But so all of that said though, it's part and parcel of a, a significant transnational political moment in the Canadian context that had huge implications for both black Canadian politics and the Caribbean. And there's a way that, you know, if you think about CLR James's presence here, he was working with a group in fact, the most significant thing about his presence here was not the fact that he was here himself, but he was working with a, a group of young Caribbean women and men who essentially adopted C.L.R. James in the same way that somebody like Andai would have adopted Selma James slightly, slightly later, right? Because they were thinking about how to radically transform the Caribbean and equally important, I would say, to radically transform the world. And James's conception of self-organization um, you know, and, and radical transformation was profoundly important to them. And then just to add though, it's next to, and, I, and I, I know I need to be careful how I say this because, you know, there are Caribbean politics that we can talk about outside the Caribbean and black radical politics, et cetera. And of course, Caribbean politics inside the Caribbean. And of course, they're not mutually exclusive because many of the people that I'm talking about, they were back and forth between North America and the Caribbean region. In many ways, this group, it, it, it's almost inconceivable, impossible, although it happens often, to talk about the emergence of the, the, the Caribbean New Left in the 1960s and 70s without thinking about the emergence of this group in terms of the Abang movement in Jamaica, the New Beginning movement, which was kind of pan-Caribbean, but had its roots in Trinidad. The Grenada Revolution, which unfolded out of several organizations, including Movement for the Assemblies of People, which was founded by Franklin Harvey um, and others who was part of this Montreal group. So you have Tim Hector and Cools, uh, Robert Hill and Franklin Harvey, key figures in various groups across the Caribbean um, who, would, who would later go on to play a crucial role. So those groups and that moment was profoundly important for what would emerge in the Caribbean in the, in the late 1960s early 1970s. But part of your question goes back to, you know, your first question earlier in terms of thinking about what this thing called the Black radical tradition is and, and what it represents. And, you know, there's this wonderful article by Paget Henry where, in which he talks about the, the, the kind of socialist or socialistic politics in the tiny island of Antigua from the 19, from the post Second World War period through to the 19, through to the 1980s, 1990s actually before Tim Hector passes away. And one of the things that he says in talking about the politics of Antigua and in many ways the Carib Caribbean radical tradition is that is just what it has, that, it, that, that that part of the world has a great deal to teach the rest of the world in terms of thinking about politics. And he explores the transition from Vere Bird, for example, from a kind of socialistic politics in the post-Second World War period towards a, a kind of form of state capitalism. And what he tells us is that, you know, if we do take the Caribbean seriously, there's a way we can think about that transition in Antigua as anticipating transitions that would have happen in other parts of the world, including China and including the former Soviet Union, right? So that's a way of saying that, you know, we can, you know, and, 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 and those politics, Tim Hector was actively involved in, somebody who was very much involved in this Montreal group. So 
So I guess what I'm trying to say is that, you know, that moment bears fruit and bears lessons in a multitude of ways, you know, but it, but, but it involves kind of making a transition where we, I guess, you know, begin to think about the Caribbean and, 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 and the politics of the Caribbean as a place where people make history that has something to tell the rest of humanity. And I, but I think, David, the other thing that you sort of just with Asad, if you don't mind me jumping in, is that, you know, we are talking about a generation, and Andai, Bobby Hill, I mean, Lyndon Gracie Johnson is 10 years younger than Andai, but Andai, Bobby Hill, all of them, you know, are of a generation that um, grows up in the anti-colonial period, in the ferment of the anti-colonial period. And then also is, as you're pointing out, they are part of this generation that is um, beginning to become deeply critical of the neo-colonial turn, what Trinidadian economist Lloyd Best refers to as the exchange, but not the real change, then inspired and excited by the Grenada revolution and the possibilities for a variety of projects from Cuba to Grenada to the democratic socialist experiment of Michael Manley, to then the disappointment and the trauma of the collapse of Grenada. And so I think there, there's something about that generation that is also really important. And, and I wanted to also say that in, in those itineraries, itineraries that you map, there is also the itinerary of 19, there's the itinerary of the Caribbean Conference Committee and the New World Group in Montreal with, um, mm. with uh, Carrie Levitt that you write so beautifully about. There is the 1968 Congress of Black Writers um, that leads to Walter Rodney's deportation from Barbada, uh, from Jamaica, um, where he then ends up in London, Dar es Salaam, before coming back to Ghana. But I say that because I saw a note in the chat about Jessica Huntley. And in fact, it is those lectures that are taken yeah. up to London. I, I have learned this, you know, the, the whole journey of this via um, conversations with Walter's school friend, Ewart Thomas, in the last um, week or so, um, are taken up to London. And, and it is the publication of those lectures, Walter Rodney's Groundings with My Brothers, that is the foundation stone for what would become um, Bogle Louverture publishers with um, Jessica and her husband, Eric Huntley. So there's that. There is also, we have Steve McQueen's um, wonderful sort of release and the first mm -hmm. is on, on, on the Mangrove Nine, Althea LeCount, um, who comes from Trinidad and Tobago, you know, and thanks to the incredible work of a historian, Chris Johnson, in my own department at the University of Toronto, we learn of Althea LeCoint's connections, not just to Trinidad, but that her sister, Beverly Jones, was part of NUF, which was the Freedom Fighters during the Black Power um, Rebellion in, in Trinidad and Tobago, who was killed in 1973. Um, you know, and then there's Darkest Howe. And, and, you know, so there's all of these reverberations that I also think that there's a generation of... Um, wonderful new scholars and activists. There's a book out, The Fire That Time with, by Nalini Mabir and, and Ronald Cummings that talks about the you know, Sir George Williams affair and, and tries to bring in precisely some of those voices as you pointed out, David, that are have been left out by a certain way in which that archive has been ordered. So, so just fleshing mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and again, you know, the point is, is not to visit that history romantically but right to, to revisit it critically, you know, to understand and think through those same questions in our moment. And I think, you know, that material has offers a great deal in terms of thinking about the politics of gender, race, class, statehood, politics from below. And, and again, in a critical way that, you know, because for me in that sense, the point of history is, is absolutely about the present. And when we probe that moment, it tells us a great deal about our time, I think. Mm -hmm. Precisely. I think that's a, uh, that brings us to, um, to, I think, one of the, one of the important uh, um, um, insights that we can get uh, from reading about this tradition, reading about this history. Uh, how does it inform our politics in the present? Uh, you know, we uh, have the uh, unfortunate persistence of the relevance of anti-capitalism today. Uh, we, we, we have not overcome this problem of confronting capitalism as uh, all of these thinkers uh, and uh, militants uh, did in the past. And so, uh, I, you know, I, I'd love to hear more about uh, 
uh, how both of you think that uh, these uh, ideas and uh, um, practices can inform uh, our politics in the present. I think, you know, to be short, I think ultimately we're asking the question like, you know, what kind of world do we want to live in? Right? What, what kind of world that we want to be part of? And I think that's the question to the experience of the Caribbean, to the experience of, of being racialized subjects in a North American and European context. We're talking about the UK too. This is the question that these folks were posing. And ultimately, with some variation, folks were saying that there's no, you know, in order to build an egalitarian kind of society, we need to think, think about how we organize for change. And that's a process that begins from below. That was the point of departure. And, you know, when we, when we think about that and we think about the role of art and poetry, you know, and I, yes, I kind of invoke the word and not reintroduce because, you know, socialism has kind of come back in vogue in some respects, in some quarters, and even in the unlikely context for, for, you know, of the United States, at least in terms of what some people would have anticipated, right? But, but really it's posing that question, what kind of society we want to live in, right? And how do we bring that society into being? And really it's about how we organize for change. And, you know, that moment is not a blueprint. It doesn't offer a blueprint in terms of how we, we, we respond to that question. But I think, you know, and going back to um, Alyssa's point about Ndai, it's about when we, we, we build theory in the practice of organizing and organizing produces its own theory. Right? And, you know, so these are not academic questions. It's about, you know, how we conjoin theory and practice in our day-to-day -day lives. And in, and, in, and, in, and in our day-to-day -day practices. And I think, you know, um, that tiny part of the world that we call the Caribbean, which has produced a tremendous amount of creativity, we think about artistically, also in terms of the, the sports and the aesthetic and even the aesthetics of sports. But I think we've often failed to appreciate, you know, even with the, and even with the collapse of the Grenada Revolution that, that Alisa alluded to, you know, if we're talk, if we're if 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 the goal is to revisit whatever it's called, some some notion of a more egalitarian society, we need to dissect what happened in Grenada, you know, from top to bottom in terms of understanding why that process fell apart. Not only because of outside intervention, right, but because of internal practices too and internal politics. So so I think you know, it, it might sound like a bit of an abstract response to your question, but it involves doing the work of probing the politics of those moments right, in order to understand better the, the time that we're in today. And, and I would say drawing to Mandaye that she said, you have to have a vision, a vision, yes, but never a prescription for where you were going, right? And she's speaking, this is a direct criticism of a certain vanguardist or Marxist Leninist approach that you Grenada. knew exactly what was going to unfold. But I'm kind of laughing because she was pretty irreverent and there's a way in which she would say, yeah, you could study and study the Grenada revolution till the cows come home. It is better that you work this out in the concrete context of the struggle that you are actually engaged in right now, um, bringing what you have learned from that into, you know, so what she learned from that was to go back and look at the 82 Housewives Rebellion and recognize the way in which it had completely misread and misrecognized and invisibilized the, the, the work of housewives, right? That, the Grenada Revolution taught her about the importance of, of aesthetics and beauty and poetry and the way in which when Carter talks about building a free community of valid persons, it's about the imagination and visioning and the, the importance of cultural workers, which was something that George Lamming was really involved in during the Grenada Revolution. But I, so for me, here's two quotes from her. She says, quote, March 19th, 1979 had fired and fueled our self-belief while October 1983 precipitated a collective loss of confidence. Her second quote, our retreat, however, from the project of transforming the region has meant a failure to contest the deepening of the structural violence, end quote. And in relation to what David is saying about how Grenada sort of has interrupted everything, she says very simply, last quote, it is time we get over it, period. It is time we get over it. And this was how, and I thought, right? We don't have time for this. The fact that it failed, she says in one of her essays, doesn't mean that the vision wasn't important 
doesn't mean that the vision didn't matter, that we need to sort of boldly reclaim that vision. We, we, we can not reclaim all the parts of the method that left so many people out, but reclaim the vision in the face of all the crises that are surrounding us. And I'll just list three or four in the past two weeks that have come up on my screen, you know, that, that, that tell us about this new imperial, new extractivist moment that we're in in the Caribbean. The, the, you know, the determination of um, uh, foreign companies with the complicity of the Jamaican government to destroy cockpit countries through bauxite mining. The attempt by a Belize port expansion and cruise project to dump 5 million cubic meters of dredged spoils, that's equivalent to 200,000 school buses off of the Belize Barrier Reef. This is a country where women stood up and single-handedly ensured that a moratorium on deep sea drilling um, would happen in Belize. And that brings me to the third and most egregious right now, which is Exxon mining in Guyana, where if you wanted no clear example that there is no difference between a coalition that attempted to rig the election results and a government in power now that has attempted to ride into power and pretend it is innocent, it is their complicity in the selling out of the country's patrimony to Exxon, Exxon Mobil in the form of a production sharing agreement that was first signed under the PPP, renegotiated under the coalition government, that even the IMF has said is a ridiculous, um, has, has said is a very generous agreement, saying we'll get all this money. Reports have just shown that Diana at this moment owes almost 1 billion US dollars to Exxon because we have to repay all of their development costs. So, so and I, I think would be very impatient. She would say, it is time we get over it. We need to build, we need to move, we need to start. And, and if there's one thing that she always had faith in, even in her deepest, darkest moment, it was that there was always social motion somewhere and that you had to begin there and develop the organizing capacity of working people, that the place to start is with the unwaged, the place to start is with caring labor because that is not only the foundation of our society, but it, it sort of offers a different set of values and a different orientation that can take us somewhere else. There's a, a moving forward in the, in the book by Anna Ford Smith, where she beautifully languages it as the principle of justice as a labor of caring, a principle of justice as a labor of caring. And I think the way in which it is demonstrated most effectively over the course of Andaye's life and death. There's a poem by Martin Carter says that life is the question asking, what is the way to die? And I think that that line by honor that Andaye taught us what it means and how it means that you, how you die, because her, um, the support that she managed to galvanize around her, the caring communities, the humor you know, the humor, she kept saying that I was the worst editor she'd ever worked with. And we, you know, Carol Laws, her Jamaican friend came on and saved the day, but she kept saying she can't die until the book is done because if I publish it, it'll be just an utter embarrassment. But the humor in all of this, the way she stitched folks together around the world was to me the best example of a, of a different kind of world. And that's where I think, you know, foregrounding those who we don't often see the folks, the, the women, the gender non-conforming, the queer folks, whether in the Caribbean or beyond, that that's the work we have to do, but always emphasizing the connection, always emphasizing the need to make space for everyone equally, and always emphasizing that the struggle is a struggle against capitalism. And that's the last thing I want to say that for me, the most exciting parts of the Black Lives Matter movement in the US, I'm giving as an example, which I don't often see talked about enough, but for me as a Caribbean person and thinking with a feminist, radical Caribbean tradition, the parts about it that excite me most are the parts I wanna hear more about. That is the work that Alicia Garza, Patrice Cullors and Opal Tometi did with immigrant um, rights they did around domestic workers, which obviously brings you into contact with migration and domestic workers, that kind of transnational work that gets to the heart of a global capitalist political economy. I think those are the kinds of threads that we need to stitch together um, to, to build this new world that we don't have a choice but to build. And if you begin with the women that, and I end her book with, the women who have no option but to struggle for survival or go under, and if we put ourselves there, then we understand fundamentally what is the work to be done. Um.
such an eloquent way of uh, uh, stitching together the threads, as you said. Uh, we don't have too much time left. Uh, I just want to give David an opportunity to um, perhaps uh, respond or elaborate on uh, the, the, what Alyssa said or add uh, other points uh, that you want to make sure we touch on. No, I think, you know, I think that's a beautiful way to end. I mean, the only thing I, I would add is just in, you know, which sort of is, I mean, support of what Alyssa is saying is that, you know, you asked a question earlier and you, and you invoked James. And in our previous conversation, we had talked about, you know, James and the generation that came after him, uh, Walter Rodney and, and Stokely and Stokely Carmichael. And, you know, when I listen to uh, Lisa speaking, you know, I mean, ultimately what she's speaking about and ultimately what people like Rodney and Andai were very clear on is that we need to confront power in whatever form it sort of, it, in, 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 in whatever form, form it, 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 it takes. And, you know, so for, so for James, you know, you know, in his kind of conversation slash debate with Stokely Carmichael, he was trying to get Stokely to understand that culture cannot just be simply understood in, in essentialist ways. There are ways that we can talk about class being a form of culture and class being a form of identity, right? And, you know, when we talk about the Caribbean radical tradition, we're talking about parts of the world and we could have the same conversation about the African continent where people are African, and in some cases, depending on which country we're talking about, Indian origin, are in power, right? But where does the power, how does power function in relation to the people, the so-called peop people down below, right? And that's the penultimate question, which doesn't allow us to just jump beyond race, right? But allow us to think in more complex ways about how race class along with gender and sexuality converge. And sometimes because, um, because of the ever present dynamics of race in the North American and in the European context, and particularly I think about England, which I'm more familiar with, you know, we don't get to have those conversations right? because of the thickness and the weight of a certain kind of anti-blackness. Right? And I think what the folks that we've been referring to and the tradition that we've been referring to at its best understand how power operates in order to eclipse the life chances of everybody. Yeah. And it's not, and, and, and class being a particular form of power um, that, that, that operates within the context of, 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 of capitalism to eclipse, eclipse those life po possibilities. Well, I know that I would love to get Alyssa and David to keep talking and talking for more hours, but I don't think that we can uh, put them through that. Uh, we've, we've gotten so much uh, insight and uh, I've learned a lot uh, through this discussion. And so I want to uh, very much thank uh, the speakers, Alyssa and David, and I want to thank the organizers uh, of this discussion. And I'd like to thank all of you who uh, came to listen. And uh, that's all the time we have. So, so thanks once again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.